But with so much going on right now across MLB, as the trade deadline is less than a week away, we've got plenty of other stuff to focus on tonight, other than the ins and outs of that ball game. It was started by Jack Flaherty, and so we'll talk about that aspect of things, as it very well may have been the final start by Jack Flaherty in a Cardinals uniform. It seems with some of his quotes after the game and some of his maybe behavior during it, chatting with Adam Wainwright, taking in the sights and sounds perhaps of his final start with St. Louis, seems that Jack Flaherty is maybe starting to realize that this is a distinct possibility that he is not on the St. Louis Cardinals the next time his turn through the rotation would come about. Certainly, I am of the mind on this podcast that that is the situation the Cardinals need to make sure unfolds. They need to trade Jack Flaherty. They need to trade Jordan Montgomery. And if they're not re-signing Jordan Hicks to that extension, which we talked about in the previous episode of B-Shape Daily, scroll back one on your podcast feed on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and uh, just click the Jordan Hicks video on YouTube if you missed that one. We posted it earlier Wednesday. Typically, I'm posting these videos overnight, and so when you wake up, you'll see the next one. Didn't happen in this case, so make sure to jog back to the Jordan Hicks video if you're interested in my thoughts on that entire saga. But the Cardinals do need to be trading these short-term assets and getting controllable talent in return. Was a deal that was made, or at least reported by Jeff Passan on Wednesday night in MLB, something that could make that more difficult for the Cardinals? We'll talk about that tonight as the Los Angeles Angels have reportedly acquired Lucas Giolito and Ronaldo Lopez. Giolito being the main factor here as it pertains to the short-term starting pitching options the Cardinals have available to other teams. I just mentioned the Lopez aspect because it's interesting. When the Nationals traded Giolito and Lopez to the White Sox in the first place for Adam Eaton all those years ago, those guys were the same dudes in the package. And now they're going together to Los Angeles, which is apparently a place where they're trying to win baseball games this year. The Angels, it came out earlier Wednesday, don't plan to sell off Shohei Otani before the deadline because they're looking to add and go for it. Artie Marino kind of made up his mind, I suppose. And once he did that, the action was swift as the Angels reportedly acquire a couple of pitchers. And they're also talking with Washington about Candelario, the third baseman over there, to potentially add even more to that roster. So interesting to see the Angels going for it. I hope they make it personally because I'd like to see Otani in the playoffs. And if he's staying in Los Angeles for the final run here, it would at least be nice to get a chance to see him in October. So we'll see if that comes to fruition, but we'll talk about maybe how that impacts the Cardinals because uh, it's not to the point yet where I'm wondering what John Mosaic is waiting for, but it does seem like for a deadline that sets up so perfectly for the Cardinals with everybody around baseball virtually agreeing that there aren't really as many sellers as buyers and that sets up sort of a seller's market, so to speak, especially when it comes to the short-term starting pitching category. Does the trade between the Angels and the White Sox accelerate things for the Cardinals, or does it make life harder now that uh, one team that was looking for short-term pitching found an answer, and that answer was not Jack Flaherty or Jordan Montgomery? We'll kind of get into our thoughts on that. We'll also dive in a little bit on thoughts from today's game. I said we weren't going to spend too much time on the game specifically, but when those thoughts lead to very relevant discussion about the trade deadline, that is something we want to touch upon. Nolan Gorman is scorching hot once again, how does that impact what the Cardinals should or should not do with him at the deadline? Does Nolan Gorman have to be an untouchable in your mind as a Cardinals fan heading into August 1st? Or despite the recent power surge, does that make it the perfect time if you can come up with an ace starting pitcher heading back to St. Louis to move on from the 23-year-old infielder? Let me know in the YouTube comments section below. This has been a very controversial topic, I think, a, a polarizing one where people or maybe on different sides of the fence. But when you watch Nolan Gorman do what he did today, hit a couple of tanks out there in Arizona to get to now 22 home runs on the season, it gets very, very difficult to turn around and say, yep, that's the guy I want to trade. So let me know, Cardinals fans, where are you on the trade Nolan Gorman versus keep Nolan Gorman forever question that I think is facing the Cardinals front office right now. It may not be something John Mozilak is even considering, but it's a name that we have said a lot about in terms of his inconsistency and when you think about the depth that we thought the Cardinals had in their middle infield, might make sense to move on from one of those guys, even if, again, you like them all. You got to try to find a way to get the things you don't by trading the surplus from what you do have. And the Cardinals have a lot of middle infielders. They don't have a lot of controllable, good starting pitchers. So that is a conversation that I think is floating around. There's been a willingness from the Cardinals to trade Gorman as recently as this past offseason. 
Reporting from Derek Gould of the Post-Dispatch indicated that when the Athletics said, we want Donovan and Newtbar, the Cardinals said, how about no when it came to the Sean Murphy negotiations, but we'll give you this list of Gorman, Dylan Carlson, Burleson, and Yepes, and you can pick two of those four. And that obviously didn't come to fruition, but the Athletics evidently had Gorman dangled in their direction, and they did not bite on that on that offer. So the Cardinals had at least some level of willingness, according to reports, to move Gorman within the past 12 months. How do they feel about it now as their chase for legitimate starting pitching ramps up even further over the next week? And when I make mention of the fact that we thought the Cardinals had a lot of depth in their middle infield, maybe some of that depth has been depleted in a way that would make it more difficult to trade Gorman or anybody from this middle infield group at the deadline when you consider how the injuries have put them in a spot where Gorman's basically your everyday guy there because Tommy Edmond with the wrist is still not back. He can't play center field like he had been. He can't fill in on the middle infield like he potentially would if a Paul DeYoung trade were to come to fruition, which there was news on that front as well, not when it comes to DeYoung, but with other teams making moves, filling needs that the Cardinals potentially could have honed in on. But we saw Andres Jimenez move from the Guardians to the Dodgers for Noah Syndergaard, which is kind of weird. I don't think the Cardinals would have been interested in Syndergaard but that's another guy, a shortstop, that goes to Los Angeles. And DeYoung was definitely, I think, a candidate to go to the Dodgers, and that you can kind of check off the list now. So does that mean it's more likely for the Cardinals to hang on to Paul DeYoung? Kind of get into the speculative game on that as well as we talk all things trade deadline here on B-Shave Daily. But I wanted to mention when it came to the middle infield conversation, I guess you could call this kind of an update on Brendan Donovan and his throwing arm situation, new reporting from the Post-Dispatch, but... I feel like the writing has sort of been on the wall that this could be a situation for Donovan that doesn't get resolved soon, maybe not even this year. So we'll talk more about that Brennan Donovan stuff. And does that keep the Cardinals from being able to maximize their trade deadline in the way that they had anticipated? All that coming up tonight on B-Shape Daily. Make sure you guys are subscribed on the YouTube channel. Click that subscribe button. Click the bell for notifications so you know when our new videos come out each day. And make sure you're locked in on Spotify and Apple Podcasts to the B-Shape Daily Podcast where you can rate and review, leave five stars, let us know what you're thinking of the show. And then excited to get back to Bush Stadium tomorrow as the Cardinals will be back in town hosting the Cubs for the final full series before we get the trade deadline early next week. So plenty coming from the coverage of that series, the deadline, and much more at b Shave Daily at YouTube and also for KMOV.com, where my articles will appear over the coming days. But let's dig first tonight into the topic that we're teasing in the title of the video Talk about Nolan Gorman, his big day for the Cardinals. He continues to rake over the month of July. He goes three for five today with three RBIs and a couple of runs scored, both of them coming on home runs, batting number five in the Cardinals lineup. It was Donovan Goldschmidt, Newt Barr, O'Neill, and Gorman. Kind of an interesting alignment today as Nolan Arenado getting the day off, which, by the way, I don't think is any indication of a hug watch or anything like that, but I think... Goldie and Arenado are going to get some extra days off their feet over the rest of the season when you consider that the games just do not matter for the Cardinals, who still sit 11 games below 500. But specific to Nolan Gorman, he had that stretch where it really ramped up our conversations about should the Cardinals choose him as the guy that gets traded when they're looking to fill the obvious need in their starting rotation over the next, at the time it was, number of weeks. And now we're obviously down to the final week before the deadline. That was certainly a consideration because you had all these middle infielders, Edmund, Donovan, Gorman, all can play second base, and only one of them can be at second base at once, and the other one maybe could be the DH, but you've also got sometimes Wilson Contreras is going to DH, and Jordan Walker remains to be seen long-term, what his defensive prowess ends up being as a corner outfielder and whether or not he can stick in those spots. So lots of considerations for how to use that DH role Arnado Goldschmidt getting days off their feet defensively moving forward. Can't necessarily just pinpoint a second baseman and say, that guy can DH. Nolan Gorman, it's your spot. But right now, as we've talked about, you have injuries to Donovan and Edmund that are basically putting Gorman into that lineup on a very regular basis as the second baseman. But he's starting to respond offensively. If you look at the last 30 game numbers, it's not great because he was, I mean, when he was cold, he was ice cold. But I'm checking out the splits here on MLB.com. Last 15 games for Gorman, he's hitting 309 with a 356 on base and a 673 slug. 
which is good for an OPS north of 1,000. Five home runs and 14 RBIs over his last 15 games. He is dialing it in offensively. He's got his season-long numbers up to 828 on the OPS, which I feel like if Gorman is a guy in the low 800s, that's pretty solid. If he can develop into a guy that's 850 or above, right now, for instance, Goldschmidt is at 850 on the season, that is a perennial all-star type of guy, potentially, if he year over year can produce those types of numbers. And with the power that he has, the pure, raw, unadulterated power of Nolan Gorman from the left side of the plate, it's not something the Cardinals have regularly seen in their recent past. Like, I'm seeing tweets about who's the last pure left-handed power threat not counting switch hitters in the Cardinals organization since before Nolan Gorman. Like this guy, 22 home runs and 314 at-bats this year. He very well, I I said it a couple weeks ago, he might be a guy that gets to 35 with relative ease this year. And certainly now the way that he's going, that seems like a distinct possibility with a little over two months remaining on the season. He could certainly make a run and do that. But this is the trick and the trouble when it comes to Nolan Gorman. Which, by the way, I think the answer to that question, left-handed power threat, I think J.D. Drew legitimately might be the answer. Comment below on YouTube if you can think of a pure power-hitting left-handed swing that the guy's not a switch hitter, so you can't give me like Carlos Beltran or something. But the Cardinals have just not had this type of true power. And I I think J.D. Drew was an all-around hitter but had some power to his bat as well. But Nolan Gorman is kind of your quintessential power hitter Again, with 22 home runs at this point on the season, he's got 65 RBIs. He could very well be a 100 RBI guy this year at age 23. I think sometimes we forget about how young this guy still is. First round pick of the Cardinals in 2018, straight out of high school. And last year was kind of overshadowed at the DH position by Albert Pujols and his great renaissance in the second half of the year. Gorman just kind of got boxed out. When he was going through slumps last year, he didn't get the chance to play through those. And it just sort of fizzled out his season. Even with that, though, he was able to have a solid enough, like I would call it respectable, Nolan Gorman's rookie campaign last year. The overall numbers certainly didn't wow you by the end of the season. OPS was 721, OPS plus of 104. So 4% above league average, low batting average, on base right at 300, but hit 14 home runs and 313 plate appearances to showcase a little bit of that raw power. Struck out a ton, 103 strikeouts and 313 plate appearances. He's on a little bit better of a trajectory this year. He's up to 107 in the K's department, which is four more than he had all of last season, but he's also taken 30-some-odd plate appearances on top of what he finished with in 2022. And he's also got 22 home runs compared to the 14 that he hit last year. So increase in power, Already more doubles than he had last season. The slug is north of 500 for the season after today's game. It's at 503 with a 325 on base. If he can just learn to take some more walks, and he's got 37 walks, which is more than he had last season, but not a tremendous, I mean, it's an improvement in the walk rate. But if he could be a guy that establishes that plate discipline consistently, doesn't chase the pitches off low and away, the slider from lefties is one that can that can certainly get Nolan Gorman out on. If he can consistently eliminate that from his game and be like a 250 hitter who who walks enough to have a, a an on base of like 350, maybe I'm asking a lot, but that guy is a middle order bat for the next decade if he does those things because the power is going to be there. And so that's why it's like this conversation about trade Nolan Gorman. And I was participatory in this. I'm not going to pretend like I didn't say, look, if the Cardinals are in a bind here and they've got to choose between trading Donovan and Gorman, I would prefer I would prefer to see them trade Gorman because I believe that Donovan is a consistent force that you're not going to have to worry about slumps and he's going to bring a lot more versatility on the defensive side. But it's interesting how a couple of weeks can change things. As we now, I mentioned the reporting from Derek Gould. He's got an article that he tweeted out earlier Wednesday evening about the fact that Brendan Donovan won't be playing in in the field anytime soon, according to the Cardinals, in that surgery for his arm injury is a possibility, labeled the last-case scenario, according to Donovan, per Gould's reporting. But basically that if they can't figure out the issue, the persisting flexor tendon inflammation, the soreness, 
that has just kept going for weeks and weeks and weeks now. He's been limited to a DH role. If they ultimately can't figure that out, it could resort to Tommy John surgery, I think is what Donovan would be looking at. Some form of that, whether it's the type that you don't have to spend as long on the shelf with the recovery of, kind of they've, they've got a few different ways that they do the surgery now. But that would be what the Cardinals would be looking at with Brendan Donovan. You know, Bryce Harper, for instance, last year, I think around late November, had Tommy John surgery for the Phillies and only recently has come back and is playing first base. Brendan Donovan, a big part of his value is what he does defensively. Won the gold glove last year as the utility man. First time that award had been handed out and Brendan Donovan earned it in the National League can play corner outfield, can play basically anywhere on the infield, and I think can be above average at pretty much everywhere that you put him. So that's a huge value to the Cardinals, and he's their leadoff man. He's got an OPS now at 800 for the season, went two for five today with a couple of runs scored. He's hitting 288 with an 800 OPS. So you check the the box on batting average. You certainly check the box on on on-base percentage when it comes to Donovan. He's at 370 for the year. And now he's hitting bombs, too. The slugging at 430 isn't a huge number, but 11 home runs on the season compared to just five all of last year. And Donovan's had about 75 fewer ABs so far this season than last year. He's a guy that if he establishes himself as like a 13 to 15 to 18 to 20 home run guy on an annual basis, his value is unbelievable because he checks every box as a player, just a winning player. But if the Cardinals can't figure out this arm stuff with him, and it's not like it's the Cardinals' fault, you'd like for their medical staff to be able to come up with a solution that gets rid of the inflammation, that gets rid of the soreness, and and allows him to return to what he does best. But if the Cardinals can't do that, then I'm thinking you might see a November surgery for Brendan Donovan, and that would put the Cardinals into a real bind for next year. Just speaking about the general makeup of the 2024 roster, what he brings to the table is so valuable. And I think for a while there, you might have said, well, Brendan Donovan, Tommy Ebb, and kind of do the same thing for this team when it comes to their versatility on the defensive side. They can play maybe not identical positions because Edmund's more of a shortstop center field in the way that the Cardinals view him. And Donovan is basically everything else. Second base, third base, left field. Could put him in right field if you had to. They put him at first base plenty of times. Uh, I think you could put him at shortstop in a pinch, but they didn't often do that. So maybe not a perfect comparison to say that they're redundant on the team because they're both good players. I think the upside offensively of what Donovan brings is a little more than Edmund, but both really good winning players. But again, if you were talking about, hey, trading away one of these second baseman types, one of these middle infielders slash utility slash second baseman, maybe Edmund would be the guy that would go. Which, by the way, I think you do need to count in his offensive value. I talk all the time about how there needs to be a stat. Maybe there is one, but there needs to be a prominent stat that just counts a stolen base as an extra base on a slugging percentage or whatever. Some modification of that because you could get a single steal second base or take a walk and steal second base. And obviously that's not the same as hitting a double because you maybe had a chance to drive somebody in if they were on base when you hit the double versus just stealing it. But... Should be a way to quantify that value because Tommy Eben definitely brings that element to the table more so than most other guys on the roster do for the Cardinals. But my long-winded way of saying, when you were kind of paring it down and trying to figure out who do they trade if they really do commit to saying, we have a log jam here, we like all of these players, but ultimately we're going to have to move one of them, move from a surplus to acquire something that you don't have enough of, which is good starting pitching. That's kind of the formula that I think All Cardinals fans have been able to kind of see, but everybody that you might ask has a different viewpoint on which player should maybe be the one to get dealt. Because you can look at it and say, a guy like Donovan, even the Athletics wanted him last offseason for Sean Murphy, who's turned into just a stud with the Braves. He was already a gold glove caliber catcher, but his offense has really taken a step forward as well. And that was one of the guys the Athletics were asking for. Teams were interested in Donovan. I think they still are and still would be. But this arm injury thing, I don't know if that changes it. But for me, I had already said Donovan should not be traded by the Cardinals. Yes, if he has to have Tommy John and he can only DH early next season or if he has to miss time at all. I mean, Bryce Harper, I got to look and see when he actually returned to action offensively. But it it was a month or two into the season, I want to say. 
So you'd be missing a number of weeks, let's say six to eight weeks of Brendan Donovan next year if it was a similar timeline just to get his bat back into the lineup. It actually didn't end up being as long as I thought it was for Harper. He returned to the lineup on May 2nd, so he missed about a month, a little more than a month. But Donovan's value to the Cardinals is different than the value that Harper brings to the Phillies. Harper mashes, and what he does in the field is is kind of immaterial. But again, about half of Brendan Donovan's value, I think, is what he does defensively. So the Cardinals would be missing that for sure. It's a blow to their 2024 prospects, especially when you've got guys like Wilson Contreras, who is he going to be used as a catcher? Is he going to be used as a full-time DH? Or do they move him to the corner outfield like they talked about doing earlier this year? What the heck happens there is going to have trickle-down ramifications on the roster for sure. But you want Brendan Donovan's bat in your lineup. Like, he's he's almost two quality players merged into one. You'd take a guy that does what Brendan Donovan does defensively, even if he's just league average at the plate, and you'd take a guy that does what Brendan Donovan does offensively, even if he's not flexible or versatile or a good fielder. He is the best of both of those things combined into one player. I I mean, there's just no chance you trade him, especially at this point with the arm situation. Teams might say, ah, oh, we, we can't really give up as much to get him. No, no, no. You're just not even considering that. Edmund, I don't know if he's tradable because of the wrist injury. I think he would bring less in return. If you're talking about a starting pitcher, I think you're getting a either a guy with less team control attached or a guy that's got uh, the perception of a lower ceiling maybe more risk associated than a guy that you'd get for, I think, a Donovan or even a Nolan Gorman, where Gorman is 23 years old. He's got more years of control attached, longer until he gets into arbitration. Edmund's a little bit further into that process, and it should just be evident. The the left-handed power that Gorman brings is rare in today's game. So that's why it seems crazy. Like, why would the Cardinals even consider trading him? Well, you have to keep in mind the need. The need is starting pitching, and if left-handed power, raw, true power is valued across the game, you might be able to get a really good pitcher or a package involving some good pitching for Gorman if you were to explore that route. There's the other side of the coin, though, where the inconsistency of Gorman, does that cause other teams to say, hey, we love the upside? The upside is evident. But we also see more of a floor that, pegs him as kind of a league average defender and a guy that could kind of bottom out during stretches of play where we don't really get the full benefit of what his numbers even look like. 800 OPS, anybody's going to take that. But just a few weeks ago, his OPS was more like 750, 760, 770. And how do teams value that? Because that's not really a middle order bat in the same way that what we're seeing right now from Nolan Gorman is just very obviously, he's a middle-order stud if he's performing this way. And you kind of just have to take the good with the bad, know that he's going to be one of the more streaky guys in a lineup. He's going to have stretches where he can absolutely carry it, like he's doing right now for the Cardinals, and there will be stretches where it goes very lean. He had a month stretch where he hit like 160 or something and was slugging less than 400. Might have been less than 300. I'm not going to dig right into the numbers, but you guys remember it was tough for him there for a while. And he's clearly snapped back out of that on the other side of the All-Star break, I think is really when things started to turn around. So in times like this, you couldn't fathom trading Nolan Gorman. Is he untouchable to you as a Cardinals fan, even if it means like a Logan Gilbert from Seattle? And I don't pretend to know exactly what Jerry Depoto in Seattle is thinking, whether or not that's a swap they would be interested in. But I think Logan Gilbert is about the pinnacle of controllable pitcher that has at least been bandied about in terms of availability at the deadline. He may not be available, but that's kind of, I think, about the top end of the spectrum that you could hope to acquire. Would you trade an Olin Gorman for that guy? I think anytime you're trading extreme high upside position player for extreme high upside or legit quality pitching, it's still very risky because what do pitchers have the frustrating tendency to do is to get injured. I know that's kind of ironic when we talk about Brendan Donovan's injury being one that could require Tommy John surgery if it persists, but generally speaking, it's the pitchers that are going to get injured, and that's why when these conversations with other fan bases happen and I kind of swoop in and see them going on where people say, 
trade we should we should trade for Jordan Walker. I think this was going on with Cleveland's fan base or one of the other fan bases a number of weeks ago. And it's like, listen, you might think you've got the top pitcher or pitching prospect in the game. I do not think if I'm running the Cardinals, there is a single pitcher in Major League Baseball I would trade Jordan Walker to acquire. Not one pitcher. And I notice I didn't say pitching prospect. I said there's not a pitcher in the game that I would swap Jordan Walker to get. Because the way I view it is one of those next five or six years, that pitcher will have Tommy John surgery and miss 14 to 15 months. That's just the reality of it. And so Jordan Walker, in all likelihood, is not ever going to have to deal with that level of injury. Knock on wood, obviously. But it's just much less likely for a position player to end up having that. And even Brennan Donovan, if he does have Tommy John, you're talking about him missing X number of weeks, not even months, and then it'll be a little more time before he gets back into the field and, and returns to his full capabilities. But that's like the worst-case scenario for a position player and it's still one that'll affect the Cardinals for less than half of a calendar year in all likelihood. So that's where I come down generally on valuing position players versus pitching in trades. What's beautiful about where the Cardinals are right now is that I don't think they have to trade a middle infielder at this deadline. I don't think they have to trade Nolan Gorman to get pitching help. I think you're going to get better pitching help if you do something like that. But I also think it's an option to trade an outfielder and as much as it pains me to say it, I have mentally already placed Dylan Carlson on the New York Yankees. Uh, that's my expectation. Whether it's Clayton Beater or I think Clark Schmidt is almost a little too established for Dylan Carlson to be the headliner coming back to New York for Clark Schmidt, who's already in the Yankees rotation and is holding his own with lots of years of team control remaining. And I really like Dylan Carlson. Obviously, people who listen to my content know that. I think that the Cardinals haven't tapped into what his potential could be. I think they found every reason to maybe not belittle him, but they certainly have not given him the injections of confidence that they have provided to guys like Tyler O'Neill, which, you know, all they're doing is pushing their chips in on what they think is going to win them the most baseball games in the short term and the long term. And Tyler O'Neill does have a top 10 MVP season to his credit, and Dylan Carlson does not and has lesser numbers against right-handed pitching, which is predominantly what you see across a Major League Baseball season. So they have made their decision, and it's not like like when I see the conversation about, oh, now the Cardinals aren't going to trade Tyler O'Neill. We've talked about that in a recent podcast where Katie Wu had reported that it looks like the Cardinals are hanging on to O'Neill through this deadline. And the reason for that is they don't want to sell him at his lowest. They think he's got more in the tank, and if they're going to sell him, it might as well be after he rebuilds some value. Maybe that happens in the offseason. And if they have already traded Dylan by that point, well, they're going to add to the outfield. That's kind of going to have to be what they would do. There's a lot of things that could happen between now and April 1st of next baseball season. But, like, there's no pretense about it. There's no spite in it anymore. Dylan Carlson's not high on the pecking order when it comes to the Cardinals and the direction they want to go with their outfield mix. Therefore, I think there are other teams that would see value in him, and the Yankees seem to match up with, like, the level of pitchers that they have available to maybe pull off a swap. But if the Cardinals can send Carlson and one of the, like if the Yankees are still in it, you can send Carlson in Montgomery, which I don't know if they want him back. They just sent him to St. Louis a year ago, but maybe it's Flaherty going to New York would be fascinating along with Dylan Carlson. Maybe that's a move and it allows the Cardinals to either get back a higher caliber young pitcher in return, or maybe they could get multiple young pitchers. I think would be fascinating. And the Yankees could be that kind of one-stop shop. And they also need catching help, and I would not be trading Andrew Kisner or Yvonne Herrera, really, because I don't know that the Cardinals have the confidence in Wilson Contreras to be their catcher next year for anything more than like a partial season. But if the Cardinals were deciding to go that route, you could potentially entice the Yankees as well by offering them a catcher as part of a package for whatever you're doing. I don't personally endorse that, but I'm just trying to give you guys the, the lowdown on from a speculative standpoint, what I could see making sense for both sides. They recently, New York did have uh, their catcher go down. Trevino, I believe, it was lost to the season to injury. So maybe that's a direction the Cardinals go and they're able to fix the pitching or at least have a fighting chance to have better pitching in 2024 by trading away Dylan Carlson, which, again, I'm not out waving the flag for, but it would potentially give him the opportunity to play every day 
which I think is a 24-year-old former top prospect. is something he probably deserves a chance to do. Call me crazy. And I recognize, too, we didn't talk about last night's game, but that was a ball in center field that he probably should have caught, but it was a long run. The wall situation is weird in center field at, at Chase Field in Arizona. I'm not making excuses. Um, if Lars Newpar had made that same play, I would have said, see, that's how he looks in center field. But he has made that same play a number of times. I think you get near the walls and all those guys kind of can tend to have some trouble. And that was not Dylan's finest moment. But I wanted to make sure in case people said, ah, Brendan didn't talk about the bad thing Dylan did. It's like, all right, that was one that I think he probably should have caught. But at the same time, it was quite a long run and he just got caught up at the last second. So is what it is on that. And Cardinals probably should have scored more than one run yesterday too if they wanted to win that game. But nevertheless, this is my long-winded way of saying I think there's a way for the Cardinals to address pitching and they don't have to trade Nolan Gorman to do it. But what would you do if I told you it's Logan Gilbert, you can have him, but you got to give up Gorman. Are you willing to do that? Is the, I call it unadulterated left-handed power, just too much to part with. You slot him in with Jordan Walker as an absolute ridiculous tandem for the next five years. And hopefully beyond that, by signing the guys to extensions, but you wouldn't even have to worry about it through that point. They're both going to be under team control for a long, long time. And then you can build around those guys to have one of the better lineups in the National League. You should be. I mean, you're going to have two cornerstones, one from the left and one from the right, if you maintain Walker and Gorman. So, And Mason Wynn, by the way, is another guy that's just tearing it up right now at AAA. There's talent on the way. And Lars Newpar is on this team, solid outfielder. Brennan Donovan, we've talked about. Tommy Edmond. Yvonne Herrera might end up being a pretty good catcher as well, offensively and defensively. Like, not even just talking about the Gormans and the Arenados of the world that are sort of your anchors right now. I do think the future is bright when you look at the Cardinals offensively. And I got one message request earlier today to talk about some of the big the big hits from the Randy Flores era of him running the draft. And we'll try to get into that maybe more firmly, more deeply at some point, but not on the docket tonight specifically. But yeah, they're, they've done a nice job of developing the position player market and figuring out the guys to draft and, and get them capable, I think, at the major league level. Like, Walker is showing some really good signs. We think he's going to be a stud. Nolan Gorman has really taken a step forward from where he was last year, and that only really scratches the surface of some of the potential the Cardinals have around the diamond when it comes to this lineup, not only for this year, but for years to come. But is that exactly the point that gets you as a Cardinals fan to say, no way, can't trade Gorman? Or let me know if you're going to be bold. Comment below on YouTube. If you still feel like, no, if you can get a legit ace who's controllable, you would trade Nolan Gorman. Let me know if that's you out there, because I think there still may be some Cardinals fans who feel that way, but you've got to be darn bold. You've got to have some cojones to say it, to be willing to admit it during a period where Gorman is scorching hot. Because it's one of those deals where if you trade him and then that scorching hot period just becomes who he is for the next decade, you go, ah, oh, crap, <laughs> I messed up. I messed up. And John Mozeliak is desperately trying to avoid another, ah, crap, I messed up moment. And it would be very easy to see how it would happen with Gorman because he's literally doing it before your eyes right now. It's not like with a Rosarena or Adalis Garcia where you never actually saw it at the big league level. Gorman, in his second year at 23 years old, is doing it. He's demonstrating that he's going to have a body of work at the end of this season that's going to be pretty good offensively. Yes, there are going to be lean times mixed in, but for his OPS to be at 828, it tells you just the tremendous upside that he has. Because when he's going, he has the ability to torch opposing pitchers. And he's done it some against lefties as well. So demonstrating maybe becoming a little more of a complete hitter when he's seeing the ball well. You just got to get that version of him as often as you can. And then, yeah, he probably does become untouchable. But for now, just like we mentioned with Jordan Hicks yesterday, you're going to extend a guy who you were – on the cusp, I think, of DFAing had he had another couple rough outings back in April. That was just a, a few months ago. And so you got to remember, during the times that are going great, like what's the risk associated here? What's the opportunity cost of tying ourselves to this player when the alternative would maybe be cashing him in for something we could really use? I'm not saying that's what the Cardinals need to do with Nolan Gorman, but I think it's an interesting conversation and it's a much tougher one to have than three or four weeks ago when we were having it and people were kind of on board with it and saying, yeah, you don't want to trade Donovan because he's this and and Gorman's going to have value because 
Teams value left-handed power, and it's just a perfect match. It makes sense. The Cardinals need to have the best defense they can anyway to make up for their lackluster pitching, and Donovan's going to be a better second baseman. Plug him in there, and it's problem solved. So the other angle of that is, do you feel, and let me know on YouTube below in the comments, do you feel that because of the injuries right now to Brendan Donovan and Tommy Edmond, is that a reason that you as a Cardinals fan would say, yes, that does impact my willingness to trade Gorman? Because I'm seeing how quickly it sort of falls apart if you don't have that tremendous depth. It's interesting how quickly you can go from logjam to, oh, crap, we don't have enough. And I'm not saying that's happened. I think Gorman, you could play him every day at second base and you're going to be just fine. And it honestly helps because they have other guys that need to be DHing. They've got that whole catcher situation where he is only going to catch sometimes and he might be the third most capable defensive catcher, which if I've been laying it on a little too thick uh, in terms of like bashing Wilson Contreras, I want to make sure that that's not the way it comes across. And maybe it has, and I'll have to apologize for that. But I think offensively he has been, he has honestly to this point panned out to be exactly what the Cardinals were looking for. A spark plug to the offense. You know what his numbers are going to be in the middle of the order. He is a force at the plate. You know, 772 OPS is an OPS plus of 110. That's basically what he was in 2021, 778 OPS with an OPS plus of 109. He's been very, very similar, maybe a few fewer home runs, but largely, you know, he's got more doubles than he's than he had in 2021 as a Cub all year and 133 fewer plate appearances. So Wilson Contreras offensively has been about exactly what I think he was billed as. It's come in a streaky way where he struggled and then he's really picked it up. But I can't really complain if I'm looking at that contract from the Cardinal standpoint and look, just looking at his numbers offensively. But defensively, I do feel like there are gaps there that the Cardinals would like to see improved upon. But they kind of knew, I think, coming in what he was as a catcher. And he's made six errors this year which if I look 2019, he caught 99 games at catcher and made 12 errors as a catcher. 2021, he made seven errors in 116 games. So it seems like his defense, I think, has declined a little bit, even from where it was the last couple of years. Last year, 72 games at catcher for the Cubs made four errors. So he's caught fewer innings this season and has made more errors already at catcher than what he did last year. But it's not just the errors. Like, pass balls are something that I would definitely want to get a look at as well here. And he uh, led the league in those last year with seven. It's bolded on your baseball reference page. You never want to be bolded for that category. And he's got four of them this year. I wonder, too, about wild pitches. Yeah, 28 wild pitches allowed by Contreras this year. That's not in bold, so somebody must have been worse. I don't know if they're even grading catchers on that, though. I assume they are. 28 of them this year, only 21 last year. Again, he's not caught as many innings yet. He's about 90 fewer innings this year than last year. And he's got seven more wild pitches allowed. Five more stolen bases allowed. He's got a decent arm, though. I'm not trying to rip him for that. But, like, you know what the deficiencies were with Wilson Contreras coming in, I think, if you're the Cardinals, unless you, like, just didn't look. Because a lot of the way it was being billed in the public sphere was, hey, we've got about the, the next best thing we can in terms of replacing Yachty and what Yachty brings to the table. Clearly, that's not been the case. So I think part of the problem is maybe the Cardinals messaging where they're really trying to win the offseason and pump the tires on this signing. And then when reality falls short of those expectations, it kind of feels like a more harsh judgment of a guy when you could sit back and look and go, yeah, this is kind of what, what you should have expected. But I will say, I think catching-wise even, his numbers worse than they were last year with the Cubs. I wanted to dig into those numbers a little bit because I feel like I've been talking a lot about it recently, and people might be confused as to why I'd be doing that. But I think a lot of Cardinals fans understand it as well, that it just hasn't been all so rosy from Contreras off, uh, defensively. Offensively, I think he's done a fine job. Defensively, the Cardinals are going to have to look long and hard in, in this winter about what they want to do because you're paying him. You've, you're He's under contract for four more years, and you're paying him. Can you stomach 17 and a half mil for a DH and maybe like an emergency catcher or backup catcher 
which if he's not catching regularly, do his skills diminish even more to where you won't want to put him behind the plate? Like, there's a lot the Cardinals have got to decide about that. But I just wanted to make sure I was digging into the numbers and not just kind of ripping a guy and having it come across a certain way without backing it up by saying, here's why I'm saying these things. Like, I test has told me Contreras has not been super sharp behind the plate. And I was glad we just at least took a moment to dig into those numbers and have them reflect that, yeah, he hasn't really been super sharp behind the plate. So there's that little spiel. I think the reason I gave it was because I'm looking at Brendan Donovan going, if he gets Tommy John, he's going to have to DH for about half the year next year once he's able to pick up a bat again. And that puts the Cardinals even into more of a bind. But I don't think you can make long-term decisions like trade a Nolan Gorman because you've got all this kind of periphery stuff going on with your positioning for 2024. Like 2024 matters. You need to win games that year, but I don't think you're trading Nolan Gorman because, oh, it helps us clear this log jam. Yeah, I think you just have to make a decision on, do you trust the version of Gorman that you see right now, or do you think that next month-long slump is coming? And if I'm projecting his OPS out for the next decade, it's going to be 790 instead of 830. And that's enough for me to say, you know what? Let's get this ace because I don't think we can buy three aces in the offseason, but we can trade for one and buy another, add that to Michaelis and a suddenly resurgent Steven Matz, and maybe we're cooking with something at that point, add it to the pitching prospects we get for Montgomery or whatever. Like, I think there's a world where the Cardinals may have to make a tough decision like that. But I'm going to say that the injuries to their middle infield are going to make them second-guess it enough to where it doesn't happen. And I don't think they trade any of the middle infielders over the next week. Good or bad idea? I don't know. You let me know what you think about that. I'm not really trying to evaluate that right now. I'm just kind of laying out what I think could happen. But let me know in the YouTube comment section below how you'd like to see the Cardinals handle this quote-unquote logjam in the middle infield, which with the update to Donovan's injury and the continued lack of a Tommy Edmond in there, Maybe isn't as log jammy as we thought it was. You do have the DeYoung angle to talk about. But now the Los Angeles Dodgers, the team that I kind of thought DeYoung would go to along with one of the Cardinals starters, might as well have been Jack Flaherty. I kind of thought DeYoung would be mixed into that as well. And now Ahmed Rosario is a Dodger, which is kind of crazy to me. 675 OPS, so that's lesser than Paul DeYoung. I think DeYoung is probably consistently the more powerful hitter, certainly more power for PDJ. Ahmed Rosario has not hit more than 11 home runs since 2019 when he hit 15 homers. But a solid defensive shortstop, they give up Noah Syndergaard, which tells me the Dodgers are going to have to be looking to add pitching. Syndergaard was not lighting the world on fire for them, but he was somebody that they were using, I presume. I'll check out his numbers now. He's been making starts, but he's been really bad. 7.16 ERA. I don't honestly get this trade at all for Cleveland's side. What are they What are they seeing in Syndergaard, who's just been abysmal in 12 starts with the Dodgers? But nevertheless, they traded a, a guy who's a below-average hitter, but younger, for a Syndergaard who may very well be busted. Maybe they think they can fix him. Who knows? That was Like I said, weird trade. But what it means is Paul DeYoung's not going to be a Dodger, I have recently, I think I talked about it within the last couple of days on B-Shape Daily, am more strongly in the camp of the Cardinals need to trade Paul DeYoung and it doesn't really matter what they get back. If you can lump him into a trade that you're already making and it saves you $2 million on the buyout, even if it doesn't, like even if you have to pay some of his salary, I think the function of the move is to get Mason Wynn up here ASAP, continues like an 11-game hitting streak, I believe he's on right now, hitting bombs, the kid's got flair. He needs the experience, I think, if you want him to be full bore for 2024. Don't have it be like a Jordan Walker plays for a few weeks, and then you go, oh, actually, we have some things we want you to work on. Go back down to AAA. Cardinals can't afford that in 2024. They need the most dynamic talents on the roster the entire year playing to their capabilities. Get Mason Wynn to St. Louis by August 2nd and have him start as many games as his body can handle. As a youngster, it should basically be every game. Because I think defensively, he's major league ready. I think offensively, he's showing signs that he could be there. And I don't think he's going to be a middle order bat. I don't think in the big leagues that Mason Wynn's going to be a leadoff guy. I don't think he's going to be a perennial all-star necessarily. But he's got those raw skills 
that you could see just him developing a little more consistency with the power, and then suddenly I'm wrong, I look like a moron, and Mason Wynn is him. Like, there is a not-too-far-fetched scenario where that outcome takes place. But I'm looking at it thinking the Cardinals, like, the young is the impediment to that. They don't see a need to bring up Mason Wynn yet, especially as of the comments a couple of weeks ago by Mosellock when he was asked about it. Again, I think he was just taken aback by the kind of taken off guard by the timing of the question within the construct of a 30-minute press conference and the fact that it was asked by Frank Cusimano almost at the beginning of the presser. But I still think if it wasn't really even on their radar, how much can change within a couple-week time frame? Well, the thing that could change is whether or not Paul DeYoung is on your roster, and at that point you'd have no reason not to bring him up unless you're gaming service time, which is not really even a thing anymore anyway. You're in the second half of the season – He's not going to accrue a full year of service time. I don't even think, especially if you wait like another week, it would impact the whole, can we get a draft pick if he's rookie of the year in 2024? Just if you if you have to game it that way, go for it. Game the service time to make sure he would still be eligible. That's a deal where you've got to be on the roster day one, opening day of the season, and spend X amount of time on the roster. But he would still have his rookie eligibility if you plan that appropriately if I'm not mistaken. So regardless, I think Mason Wynn needs to be in St. Louis within the next couple of weeks. I think to get him in the lineup every day, give Cardinals fans something to to look forward to, other than Wainwright's every fifth day trying to get him to 200, Mason Wynn could be an absolute entertainer for the Cardinals and allow them to continue keeping the fan base at bay during a season where there's going to be a lot of bad baseball down the stretch, to be totally honest. Not that there hasn't been a lot of bad baseball already this season. But the young thing's interesting because the Angels say we're not trading Otani, and more than that, we're going to jump right into the market and make a deal or two over the next 24 hours after that word comes out of we're not trading Otani. That's called decisiveness. I'll give Angels credit where it's due, man. They're a completely bass backwards organization over the last decade or so with a lot of the stuff they've done. They haven't been able to find their way to the playoffs with Mike Trout and Shohei Otani. However... Artie Moreno decided, hey, we are going for it, and let's buy right now. We're trading for talent like Lucas Giolito, and now they're going for it. But the Cardinals, I think with a couple of the deals that were made Wednesday, like I said, there's still time. There's like five or six days before the deadline, but you do have a little bit of musical chairs going on where if everybody's found a place to sit, they don't need your chair. Even if you pull out the chair for them and say, here, sit in my chair, they might say, I've already got a chair. Dodgers found their chair with... The infielders, Kike Hernandez, they bring him back, have that reunion, and Ahmed Rosario today in the Syndergaard deal. Now, does that open still the Dodgers' need for pitching? Potentially. Right? If they trade Syndergaard, who should have been out of the rotation anyway. But they could absolutely go for a Jack Flaherty or a Jordan Montgomery, probably even a Jordan Hicks. Imagine the Dodgers with Hicks. They'll probably teach him, like, a certain grip or something that'll make him even more unhittable. Be completely ridiculous. But maybe the Cardinals and Dodgers still match up from that perspective. But the Angels, if they were buying short-term pitching, rental pitching, now the Cardinals are not going to match up with them. And the Angels gave up like their number two and their number three prospect in their system in this deal. Now, that may be more of a reflection on the Angels than anything else. Gave up catcher Edgar Cuero and a left-handed pitcher Kai Bush. And Kai Bush, not to be confused with Kyle Bush, the NASCAR driver, but Kai Bush is a lefty who has bad numbers in double-A. But he was their number three prospect, according to MLB's rankings. And uh, Cuero, which I may be saying his name wrong, but he's a catching prospect. Number two in the Angels' system, which I think their system probably ranks rather low, maybe rather bereft of talent. But kind of goes to show you that this is a seller's market that the Cardinals can take advantage of. But if everybody kind of finds what they need before John Mozeliak gets out there and mixes it up, then you could end up with a disastrous trade deadline for the Cardinals. I still expect that there are too many teams looking to win games and not enough sellers that's going to benefit Mosellock. This deadline is almost impossible to screw up. If you read everything that everybody in the know is saying about the markets and the way they're fluctuating and functioning, it should benefit the Cardinals tremendously. It's just a matter of whether they can take advantage and get the pieces they need for guys like Montgomery and guys like Jack Flaherty. And I'll still count Jordan Hicks among that. A day has gone by as of this recording past midnight into Thursday the 27th. We have not seen a Jordan Hicks contract extension announced. And I'm still thinking that unless 
those numbers are are lower than than some would expect. That's not a deal that should happen. The Cardinals should just trade him. I get what his value could be, but he could also have a four seven five ERA next year, and then you'd be looking back going, "Wow, yeah, he it was just kind of a, a blip on the radar when he really put it together for that one year out of five that he was in St. Louis." But I'm just sort of bringing this all up toward the end of today's podcast. Subscribe on YouTube, by the way, if you're enjoying the Cardinals content. We do it every day. So you, this is where you want to be anyway. But I wanted to bring this up because the trades are starting to happen. The Cardinals have short-term assets to give. I'm not even talking about the speculative, will they trade an outfielder? Will they trade an infielder? Will they, you know, it's not even about that. Will they trade multiple relievers? Like, is a Gallegos on the block? I thought maybe Ryan Helsley before the move to the 60-day. I still cannot get it confirmed whether you can trade somebody on the 60-day. But nevertheless, if somebody has a source for that, literally, like tweet it at me, direct message or something. I'm not afraid to be the guy that says, hey, when I don't know something, I'd like to know it and I'll try to research it. But if I don't know it and you do, then, hey, I'm not too proud to learn. But nevertheless, like I'm just talking about the easy ones. There are some slam dunk trades for the Cardinals to make here. Flaherty Montgomery finding pieces for those guys in a market that's looking for short-term pitching, should be anyway. Uh, hopefully, John Mozeliak is able to accomplish that. But I wonder, do you think that the moves that happened Wednesday with the Dodgers figuring out some middle infield depth and getting a Med Rosario and the Angels acquiring Lucas Giolito and Reynaldo Lopez, does it eventually get harder, in your opinion, for the Cardinals to make the moves that they so desperately need to make? Unloading some of the pitching that they aren't going to get the benefit of beyond this September, and you might as well stock up for 2024 with any assets that you can acquire. Let me know what you think of where the Cardinals stand as the deadline approaches and things start to heat up across Major League Baseball. Comment below on YouTube and make sure you guys are subscribed to Be Shafe Daily, either on this YouTube channel, which would love to have you hit that button, but you can also listen on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Be Shafe Daily is the name of the podcast. Look in the description to make sure you are spelling that correctly if you're searching for it out in the ether. That is going to do it, though, for this edition of the show. As always, if there's anything that exists in Cardinals land and I haven't touched on it or talked about it extensively enough for your liking, I'm at bshafer12 on Twitter. Make sure to hit me up in a tweet or a direct message if there's something you'd like me to talk about more in depth on the show. Quick plug before we get out of here for the Patreon. If you want to support me in that way, you can go to patreon.com slash bshafer12. Thank you guys so much. And we'll talk to you next time on Be Shaved Daily. Peace.